need for monetary reform. And my talk is going to be on money and how it works and how the textbooks have it completely wrong. Okay, it's useful, actually, to think how people think that money works. If you ask the man in the street uh, how money works, they, they might assume, or it's natural to assume, that the government creates a whole bunch of it, and then that money circulates in the economy forevermore, and the total amount of it would therefore remain constant unless the government occasionally printed some more of it. And certainly the total amount would never go down. It would be a one-way upward process. So, indeed, some of the money that we have in the economy works in exactly that way, pretty much. Uh, but it only constitutes about 3% of the money that we have. Uh, the bulk of it is a, a completely separate kind, uh, which can best be described as spendable IOUs. Now, the phrase spendable IOU, it's not part of our normal vocabulary, I think it needs a bit of explaining. So, uh, and in order to do that, we should first take a look at an ordinary IOU, the kind that you or I could write. So let's say Nick wants to borrow £10 from his mate Jim. Um, he could write out IOU £10 signed Nick on a piece of paper and uh, give it to Jim in return for a £10 note. Now, it's important to realise that uh, Mick didn't have to obtain this IOU from somebody else. He just created it out of nothing by virtue of writing it on a piece of paper. So now this piece of paper is valuable to Jim. He wouldn't want to lose it. It's his proof that the loan took place. But despite the fact that it's valuable, it's not actually spendable. Probably not spendable. Uh, if he tried to do, if he tried to buy some food with it, uh, I, I wouldn't fancy his chances. Now we're going to return to this uh, issue of non-spendability in a moment. But now let's come on to the uh, the end of the process. Nick gets ten pounds eventually. Maybe he he's earned it, and he gives back the ten pounds. And he would expect Jim to give back the IOU. He wouldn't want Jim to keep it. If Jim was a bit dodgy, he might sort of, at a later date claim, oi, you owe me 10 pounds. So Mick would want the IOU back. And what would Mick do with it? Well, an IOU to yourself is, uh, is no use. You'd probably just throw it away. In fact, you'd be positively keen to throw it away, or even shred it before th throwing it away, because if you got burgled or some, something and uh, this IOU got into somebody else's hands, it would actually cost you money, right? So you would want to destroy it. So, in summary, the life cycle of an ordinary IOU is as follows. Step one, it gets created out of nothing. Then, during its existence, it's valuable, but not spendable. Not this kind, anyway. Uh, and then it... it Eventually, when it, the loan gets repaid, the IOU expires back out of existence. So now, back to this uh, issue of non-spendability. Why wasn't it spendable? Um, the shopkeeper wouldn't know who the hell Mick was. Uh, he wouldn't know if Mick was creditworthy. He wouldn't know whether Mick would pay the £10 if he was presented with this. He probably couldn't even find him. So uh, this, this doesn't work. But now consider this. What would happen if a bank guaranteed mixed IOU? And they put, well, you know, like in the old days, you had those wax seals or something. Let's say there was a bank guarantee from Barclays Bank, and let's say that everyone knew about and recognized this seal. Then this would allay the shopkeeper's worries about getting the £10 back. So a bank guarantee can convert a non-spendable IOU into a spendable IOU. Now, so far, um, I've just talking, been talking about a sort of uh, fantasy uh, world, but what about in the real world? Does this process happen? And the answer is yes. Uh, if we look at an ordinary bank loan, uh, 
it's essentially doing the same thing. You are swapping a non-spendable IOU for a spendable IOU. If you go to a bank and you ask to borrow a thousand pounds, the bank will want to know that they, they're going to be repaid. They might check that you've got a decent job and a, a salary, and uh, if they're agreeable, they'll get you to sign some sort of document saying you promise to pay back. And uh, when you give them that document, what you are giving the bank is an IOU. You give the bank an IOU. Now, what does the bank give you in return? Now, in very rare circumstances, uh, they might give you a thousand pounds in cash that you walk out the door with, but uh, it's much, much more likely that they'll give you either a checkbook or a debit card or simply numbers in your account. And those represent an IOU from the bank. It's not money that they've uh, got from depositors. They just create it on the spot by virtue of, of typing it into a computer. To summarize, money is created when loans are made. And it disappears again when the loan is repaid. So money is continually being created and destroyed. At any instant in the economy, there will be thousands of people creating money by taking out new loans and thousands of people destroying money by repaying existing loans. And you can visualize the, uh, this dynamic uh, as, a, as a bathtub, half filled with water. Uh, but importantly, you'll notice the plug is removed and water is draining out. So the water running in represents the rate of new loans being made, and the water running out represents the rate of repayment of existing loans. And the total amount of money there is in the economy corresponds to the level of the bath water. And as you can imagine, it can go up as well as down. Now, some people are rather skeptical about this idea. They don't believe that money works this way. You, you find a lot of resistance when you try and explain this to people. Now, one of the main reasons is because it's, it's very commonly thought that when banks um, lend, say, a thousand pounds to someone, they must be borrowing a thousand pounds from and paying interest to somebody else. Therefore, the idea of money being created out of nothing must surely be wrong. But in fact, there's no contradiction between that idea and this explanation. And to see why, we need to have a look uh, in a little more detail about the process of lending money. And as a simplification, we'll just pretend that there's only one bank in existence. And let's consider um, someone who wants to borrow money to buy a car and someone who's going to sell their car. And they both bank with the same bank. So uh, step one is that the car buyer will give a loan and he will be given a uh, thousand uh, pounds of freshly created IOUs. Step two is that uh, the car buyer converts, it, swaps the freshly created IOUs for the car. And then what's the car seller going to do? He's going to store uh, that money in his bank. And it looks rather as if the car seller is lending money to the bank and the car seller might want interest to be paid to him for that loan. So we end up uh, in stage four, um, where the, the car buyer will be paying interest uh, to, to the bank for his loan, and the car seller will be receiving interest uh, from the bank uh, for, for storing his money there. And the bank will be making its profit on the difference between these two rates of interest. So it's actually true that banks make their money on the difference between uh, what it earns in interest making loans and what it uh, pays in interest to depositors. But it's also true that banks create money out of nothing. There is, in fact, no contradiction. Now, given the resistance to some of these ideas, I think we need some strong evidence that they're true. So here's uh, Mervyn King, former governor of the Bank of England, and he said, when banks extend loans to their customers, they create money. So you couldn't be any clearer than that, really. 
And then in 2014, the Bank of England themselves published um, a technical document in which they said, uh, just as taking out a new loan creates money, the repayment of bank loans destroys money. Uh, this is a very important document. It's, uh, it's a rare document that describes the whole system accurately. And it, it's rather different to what uh, is explained in most textbooks. So some of these references at the end, might you be able to get them via Adam? Uh, Talk to me afterwards. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll give you... Yeah. Okay. We'll, have a, we'll have a Q&A session yeah. afterwards as yeah, well. Really. So another thing that's in the textbooks um, is that we're, they'll make a big song and dance about uh, something called reserve requirements and capital adequacy. And the way that they're described in the textbooks gives you the, the impression that these mechanisms put a, a ceiling on the amount of loans that banks can make. Uh, but in practice, they're a bit like the rules that say that multinational companies are supposed to pay their taxes. And we all know uh, how easy it is for them to uh, sidestep these rules. And in fact, um, central bankers themselves know that these, neither of these work properly. They know that they don't put a cap on the, uh, on the amount of money that exists. So here's one of the documents that's caused a lot of trouble in the past. It's called Modern Money Mechanics, published by the uh, Federal Reserve. And uh, it's confused a lot of people. In fact, um, uh, Wikipedia used to rely on this document rather a lot. Um, it doesn't anymore, partly thanks to me, actually. Um, uh, and unfortunately, the Zeitgeist Addendum film relied on this document. Um, unfortunately, the document is, is, is really very misleading. And there are a couple of clues in the document um, that perhaps some people didn't quite notice. Uh, in the preamble, it actually says, the relationships shown are based on simplifying assumptions. So this should alert you to, it's, it's kind of saying in advance, well, this isn't quite right, we've botched it a, a bit. And then uh, the document has pages and pages telling you a story about how depositors uh, leave their money with the bank, and then the bank lends out that money. And it gives tables and equations and detail and detail about this story, confirming it over and over again until virtually the last page when it says, of course, they don't really pay out loans from the money they receive uh, as deposits. So it's kind of saying uh, that all you've read so far is a load of baloney. It's not really true. So if you, if you want an accurate document, you should, you should read the, uh, the Bank of England one. That, uh, that is really very much better. Now, uh, when people first hear about our, our monetary system, uh, some people come, become concerned that interest cannot be repaid. Their logic is that banks create the money to lend out, and that money disappears when the loan is repaid, but they don't create the money for the interest payments. And people often conclude that this means that it's a mathematical certainty uh, that borrowers will fail to pay all of their loans on, in aggregate, um, unless uh, a, a sort of a botched way of fixing it is to encourage people to borrow more and more over time. And they think that that's the only way to fix it. Now, I happen to disagree with this view, and I'll show you why. By the way, it's not just me. Um, Professor Steve Keane has shown mathematically why. Actually, there's no problem with, with interest. Um, and I think, I'm, I'm hoping I can demonstrate this with a diagram. Now, here is an incomplete diagram. Um, I'll, I'll add more in a minute. It's an incomplete, incomplete diagram, which I think is in the minds of some of the people that worry about uh, whether interest can be paid or not. So we've got banks on the left, and the economy, the rest of the economy on the right, uh, comprising households and industry. And uh, let's consider the flows of money. So within the economy, uh, we've got wages that are, uh, are paid to households from industry. And uh, the corresponding flow is purchasing. People 
uh, households buy the stuff that industry produces. And ignoring everything else at the moment, uh, I think it's fairly easy to imagine that uh, a constant sum of money could flow uh, in this region forever, with, with wages being approximately equal to uh, purchasing. So, so there's no issue there, there's no unsustainability. And now, if we, we consider the flows between banks and the economy now, but ignore this for a second, if we just consider the rate of new loans and the rate of repayments, imagine that as interest-free, you could imagine those two being equal and opposite forever. Let's say, I don't know, it's a million pounds a day being, being lent and a million pounds a day being repaid. That's no problem. These two could balance. This is then the problem. Loan interest repayments. It seems that this can't possibly balance. And now we have to add the balancing factor. This is the part that some people uh, uh, don't notice. The thing is, banks aren't in business just to earn a big pile of money and sit at the back of the bank counting it. Uh, no, no, they want their, uh, their Ferraris and Lamborghinis and their yachts and, and whatever. And also, uh, the bank have to pay the rental on their buildings and they have to pay their staff. So there is a considerable amount of money that corresponds to bank spending. And it's the interest payments that funds the bank spending. So uh, I hope to convince you that uh, uh, these two rates of flow can be equal and opposite indefinitely. I'm not saying they always are exactly all the time, but uh, it, it's at least possible. There's no uh, mathematical paradox to resolve. So, um, some people might, might think, uh, well, if there's, if there's no uh, problem with uh, interest payments, then what's, what's wrong with the fractional reserve uh, banking? Um, maybe I should have said earlier, our monetary system is known as fractional reserve banking. And I would say that the problem is to do with instability. So, consider the run-up to an economic bubble, the, the upswing of, a, of, a, of an asset to price bubble. So uh, a bubble could be in shares or in housing, perhaps. And uh, in, in this case, let's, let's talk about um, housing in the, in the run-up to 2008. Uh, people were borrowing like crazy, and part of the reason that they were borrowing like crazy was that they saw that house prices appeared to be going up very steadily for a long time. And uh, so they, you know, they're, they're begging their banks, lend, lend us some money, and uh, there, was a, there was a bonanza or a frenzy of house buying. So this, this loans tank was gushing like crazy, and uh, correspondingly, the repayments tap was gushing like crazy because you, you have to start repaying almost the instant you have to see, you, you, you do the borrowing. But uh, notice that part of the enthusiasm is the prediction that the prices are going to go up indefinitely, and of course they can't, and at some point people will lose confidence that the prices are going to carry on going up. And when that happens, the enthusiasm uh, suddenly uh, diminishes. It can, it can not quite vanish overnight, but it can, it can diminish very sharply, very quickly. So this, this loan step suddenly goes to a trickle, but the repayments has to carry on just as it was before. Uh, you know, just because hash prices are going down, the banks don't let you off the uh, mortgage repayments. So you can, you can see what's, uh, what's going to happen uh, uh, now. If, if, if the government and central bank uh, does nothing, the, uh, the water is going to diminish. Uh, this is, in fact, the credit crunch. Right here, or, or, you know, a single picture encapsulating the credit crunch. And this is certainly what happened in the Great Depression in the uh, late 20s, early uh, 30s in the States. People were, were borrowing money like crazy to buy shares, uh, and that bubble suddenly burst. And uh, in that instance, the government and, and the central bank didn't really do very much. And so what happened was the money supply shrank by about a third in the next few, 
uh, in the years following the, the big crash. And a shrinking, economic, a shrinking money supply is a horrible economic environment. People go around scratching their heads thinking, why is there less money than before? And people think that, uh, oh, well, you know, some people might, must be hoarding it somewhere. There must be some big secret pile of it. But uh, no, this is what's happening to it. It's actually disappearing. I think, I think it's very sad that uh, uh, you know, the, the mainstream media uh, don't tell you this. You know, uh, we've, we've, we've had the crash, you've all watched Newsnight. When, when have you heard any, uh, anyone talking about this? Um, now, this time round, um, unlike in the in the 30s, the government uh, uh, wanted to do something. They didn't want the money to supply to suddenly crash. But what they did was they said, "My God, the only cure for this is to try and encourage more borrowing." So they put interest rates down to zero and did things to try and prop up the housing market. Um, they, they had um, the scheme Help to Buy, which is still going on and being cranked up. Uh, but all of these schemes, the zero interest rate uh, and the Help to Buy, what they're doing is helping rich people, essentially. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's rich people that do a lot of borrowing to buy assets, and it's rich people that own houses that are going up uh, in price. So the, the only cure that the government can think of for this scenario is to make rich people richer, which of course has to be at, uh, at the expense of poorer people. So this stinks. This is why the fractional reserve banking system is so bad. Bad for certain parts of the population. True. Most of us. <laughs> so, what's the alternative? The alternative is a system called full reserve banking, which is just a fancy way of saying exactly like the description that a man in the street would give uh, for the monetary system, which is just to exclusively use everlasting money and don't have any spendable IOUs, just ban spendable IOUs. It's a bit like putting the plug in. <coughs> if you put the plug in, you don't have to encourage more, uh, more borrowing. Um, so here's a, a few uh, important proponents. Uh, Irving Fisher, he was around in the, uh, in the 30s, he was promoting it, and um, at the time it was taken really very seriously by um, academics and in government. And, uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately, it seemed to fail at the last hurdle. Uh, I think the politicians were just a bit too scared uh, to do something so radical, and then war broke out, and it, it, it all got forgotten. Uh, in more modern times, uh, the guy in the middle is Ben Dyson, uh, who founded the Positive Money Pressure Group. And uh, on the right, we have Martin Wolf, who is um, the chief economist at the Financial Times. Now, interestingly, uh, Martin Wolf was one of the panelists on the Independent Commission for Banking, uh, which was uh, instigated in 2010. Uh, there was a bunch of economists who were uh, supposed to write a report on the, on, the, on the banking system and sort of analyze what had gone wrong. And at the time, um, none of them had scarcely given full reserve banking any thought, and in their report it was, it was just dismissed in one or two sentences as, you know, what's, what's that silly idea? Uh, but since then, uh, Martin Wolf has, uh, has done an about turn and is now a complete convert and uh, a, a supporter of full reserve banking. I, I just wish he'd got his back act together a few years uh, earlier. So, uh, in conclusion, um, I, I would hope that you go and have a look at positivemoney.org uh, and uh, join the campaign. So, uh